This here is an analog panel meter and today we will turn it into a clock. This is how it looks like and just like an analog clock, the red needle here points to the current time. The three green LEDs blink along every second just for fun and the yellow LED is a PM indicator. You can adjust the time with two buttons. The left one makes it go up and the right one makes it go down. The third button turns the clock on and off. In this mode it draws so little current that this circuit can run for a dozen years or more before you ever have to replace the batteries. And when the clock is turned on again the time is still there of course. And in this video I will show you in detail how you can build a clock like this for yourself. What components you need, how to assemble them on a breadboard, how to modify a panel meter to work as a clock and how to program the microcontroller from your computer. And in the end I will show you how I took this circuit and put it inside one of these old fashioned tachometers ending up with one of the most unique Ghostbuster style clocks that I have ever seen. Hi, my name is Jens and I believe that everybody can learn electronics and this channel here is all about beginner friendly electronics tutorials with and without microcontrollers. And if you want to build this clock for yourself and I think you totally should, then here is what you need. A 4.5 volt AA battery pack and of course also the batteries and a 400 pin breadboard. The PIC16 F1455 microcontroller, a 32.768 kHz watch crystal and a 5 volt DC DC converter. Two 22 picofarad capacitors, two 100 nanofarad capacitors and a 100 microfarad capacitor. Three push buttons, three 4.7 kilo ohm resistors and four LEDs with 220 ohm current limiting resistors. You also need a panel meter and a multi-turn potentiometer. I am using a 30 volt meter here with a 5 kilo ohm potentiometer but no worries I will show you in detail how you can modify and use any other panel meter for this project as well later in this video. And last you also need the Pickkit 3 programmer, a 5 terminal connecting cable and some wires and I recommend American wire gauge 23 or 0.6 millimeters. As always there is a companion article to this video on my website friendlywire.com with additional details, background information and download links for all the free software I use. There is also a list of all of the electronic components used in this project including links on where you can buy them online. And while you're there also consider signing up for the monthly friendly wire email list to be notified whenever there is a new video the link is in the description. But I actually upload less than once a month so chances are that on average you'll only get an email every six or seven weeks or so. Anyway back to the project. So here is the main idea. The star of the show is the panel meter that is supposed to tell us the time and we drive that panel meter with a voltage from our microcontroller using so called pulse width modulation or PWM for short. The microcontroller also works as the brain of our clock and it uses a special watch crystal to measure the time. The three buttons are our user inputs that we use to adjust the clock. Up and down adjusts the time and on off is the power button. When the clock is off it will keep running in the background in sleep mode, more on that later. And the four LEDs give us some additional readouts. And all of this runs on batteries so that we can take this clock with us wherever we like. Of course we need to tell the microcontroller how to do all that and for that we need to write a program. And we will get back to that a bit later in this video. We write this program on our computer and to get this program onto the microcontroller we need to connect the microcontroller to the computer with a so called programmer and we will be using the Picket 3 for that. And if this is your first time meeting a microcontroller then don't worry about it I have you covered. I have a detailed introduction video for you right here that you can check out after this video and many other videos on my channel that deal with microcontroller projects and tutorials that will get you set up in no time. Here's our sketch again with all the components we just talked about and that is how this general idea becomes a schematic. The PIC16 F1455 microcontroller is in charge of everything. It controls the four LEDs, reads the status of the three push buttons and it uses the 32.768 kHz crystal here to create a one second time base so it can work as a clock. It also outputs a pulse width modulation signal here that we feed to the panel meter. This 5 kilo ohm potentiometer here is used to calibrate the maximum position of the panel meter's needle and together with this 100 nanofarad capacitor here it also works as a so called low pass filter. This filter turns the digital PWM signal that looks something like this into a smoother signal like this. 
Let's talk about power. The three AA batteries run this circuit and their voltages add up to 4.5 volts in total. But when in use, the batteries mm -hmm. get older and their voltage becomes lower, so it'll be only 4.4 volts at some time, then 4.3 volts, and so on. But we need to make sure that we can always generate a stable maximum voltage for the panel meter because otherwise the position of noon, which is the maximum position on the right, would change on the panel and shift from 12 towards 11 and so on as the batteries get older. The solution is quite simple. This here is a DC-DC step-up converter that takes an input voltage from 1 to 5 volts and converts it into a fixed output voltage of 5 volt, which is just super handy to have. You can buy these as ready-made modules. And these two capacitors here are just there to stabilize the circuit. Last, the Picket 3 programmer is connected to the PIC16 F1455 on the master clear, program data and program clock pins, and we also need to connect it to VDD and ground. So now we're almost ready to build this circuit. Almost. The only thing we need to do is modify our panel meter. I'm using a 30 volt version, so this video will be about that one, but you will see that it's very easy to do for other panel meters as well. So to see how this all works, let's have a look at the schematic again. So how do we know that this potentiometer here has to be 5 kilo ohm? It all depends on the panel meter you are using, so let's take some measurements. This one here is for 30 volts, but when you open it up, you actually see that there is an extra resistor in series with the coil of the panel meter. As a schematic, that looks like this. This is the resistor, and this symbol here is the coil of the panel meter. When we measure the resistor, we see that it is around 29.74 kilo ohm, and the resistance of the coil of the panel meter itself is around 284 ohms. We also need to know how much current is needed to max out the display and we can find it out as well and it turns out to be 1.03 milliamps. Most likely you have a different panel meter. I mean, what are the chances that you and I have exactly the same one, right? The good news is you only need to measure these numbers and then it'll work for you as well. And to see how that works, let's have a look how this all fits together. First, let's make these numbers a bit simpler and let's take another look at the schematic. Imagine that we apply 30 volts so that there is 1 milliamps flowing through all of this. Ohm's law then tells us that the voltage drop across the coil of the panel meter has to be 0.25 volts. This means that the remaining voltage of 29.75 volts has to drop across the resistor and at 1 milliamp this resistor has to be around 29.75 kilo ohms. And that matches pretty well with the 29.74 kilo ohm that we measured before. But for this project, we want the display to max out at 5 volts, not at 30 volts. So we need to remove this resistor and I find it the easiest to just bridge it with a wire. I'm using my soldering iron for this, but you could use an alligator clip too if you don't want to solder. And that is where the 5 kilo ohm potentiometer in our main schematic comes in. So same as before, imagine that there is 1 milliamp flowing through all of this, but the total voltage is now 5 volt. Then there is again a 0.25 volt drop across the panel meter because its resistance is still the same, but the remaining 4.75 volt need to drop across our new resistor. And at 1 milliamp, this resistor has to be 4.75 kilo ohms. And that is why I chose a potentiometer here with 5 kilo ohm, so that we can adjust it precisely to the 4.75 kilo ohm we need. Okay, but what if you have a different panel meter? I mean, what are the chances that you'll have exactly the same one that I'm using in this video, right? The first step is that you have to measure the internal resistance of the coil of your panel meter, and we call that R int, and you just write that number down. Second step, you gotta max out your display and measure the current that it takes to max out this display. And this is the saturation current, or ISAT, that we looked at earlier, and write that down as well. And step three, well, you're done. I mean, all you have to do is take these values and put them in this formula right here. Say you measure these values here, and then, well, you find the value of around 9.5 kilo ohms. And to be safe, I would recommend to take a 10 kilo ohm potentiometer because then you can tune it exactly to the value that you need. And that's basically it. And before putting the panel meter all back together, I took out the backplate, scanned it, and made up my own scale. I cut it out, flipped the backplate around, and glued on the new scale. And then it's really starting to look like a clock. It's only a small detail, but these things make projects a lot of fun. I hope all of this makes sense, but if any of this is confusing, feel free to leave a comment down here or reach out to me on social media and I'll do my very best to help you out. And with this all sorted out, let's go ahead and build the circuit. First, place the breadboard in front of you with row 1 facing to the top. Insert the PIC16 F1455 in row 14 and connect VDD on pin 1 and ground on pin 14. Next, insert the three push buttons. Connect the top left and right terminals of the first push button to VDD. We need the connection on the top right as well, because this way the two positive power rails on either side of the breadboard are connected. Then connect the top left terminals of the remaining push buttons to VDD on the left as well. 
Insert the 4.7 kilo ohm pull down resistors R5, R6 and R7 from the bottom right terminals of the push buttons to ground and then connect the same terminals of the push buttons to pins 9, 12 and 13 of the PIC16 F1455. Next, make sure that the ground rails are connected on either side of the breadboard like this. Insert the watch crystal between pins 2 and 3 of the PIC and connect it to ground with the capacitors C3 and C4. I find it helpful to solder this tiny crystal to a pin header like this. Now it's time for the LEDs. Place them on the breadboard with their cathodes facing down like this and connect their cathodes to the ground rails with the 220 ohm resistors. And finally connect their anodes to pin 6, 7, 8 and 10 of the PIC. Next is the PWM wire. Connect it from pin 5 all the way down to row 29 and insert the potentiometer R8 in rows 28, 29 and 30 so that its middle pin connects to the wire we just inserted. Connect row 30 to ground with the capacitor C5 and also insert the bulk capacitor C1 and the bypass capacitor C2 into the power rail. Speaking of power, place the DC-DC converter in rows 28, 29 and 30 on the bottom right and make sure that the input called VI is in row 30 and that the output called VO is in row 28. Connect the center pin to the ground rail and the VO output to the positive power rail. Then the positive lead of the battery pack plugs into the VI input in row 30 and the negative lead goes into the ground rail anywhere you like. We are almost done. Next is the Picket 3 programmer that has to be wired to the Pic 16 f 1455 like this. And finally we can plug in our panel meter that we prepared a few minutes ago. Its positive lead here in blue plugs into row 30 on the left side of the breadboard and its negative lead can be connected to the ground rail anywhere you like and then you can connect these two wires to the two terminals on the back of the panel meter with alligator clips. And we're done. But of course when you look at the circuit right now with the batteries all plugged in, nothing happens yet. That is because the PIX program memory is still empty so it doesn't know what to do yet so we have to write a program to make it work as a clock. So let's think about that next. And here it is, the program that makes our PIC16 F1455 run as a clock. As you can see it has many different parts and you can download this code on friendlywire.com, the link is in the description. And we'll just go ahead and copy this code into the clipboard for later. To get this code onto the controller, first plug the USB end of the Picket 3 into your computer. Then start the MPLAB IDE, create a new standalone project for the PIC16 F1455 and create a new main.c file. Paste the code from the website in here and then click on compile which is this hammer symbol on the top here. This creates a hex file that we can transfer onto the PIC16F1455 with the MPLAB IPE and the PICKIT3 that we just connected. And after a few seconds this message here shows up and tells us that the code has been transferred and now our circuit is really working as a clock. If you're new to all of this then don't worry I have a detailed video for you right here that you can check out later and in this video I explain all the different pieces of software, how to download them, how to install them and how to get it all working in no time at all. But what if you're interested in the actual code line by line by line? Well in that case I also have good news for you because there will be a dedicated video out on this in a couple of days from now where we'll actually go ahead and program the whole thing coded line by line by line together. And I'm very excited about this so stay tuned for that one. But for the rest of this video I just want to focus on the main ideas of the program. So let's go. The main feature of this program is the so-called sleep mode and everything centers around it. Now when you press the off button the clock actually keeps running in the background at a fraction of the power. But when the clock is asleep you also have to make sure that it can wake up again somehow, right? And for that we're going to use interrupts. Now this whole thing is a clock so we also need a time signal so maybe this is obvious but we'll be using a timer to generate a stable 1 hertz time signal to drive the clock. And then we have to take this time information and convert it into a voltage that drives the panel meter. And for that we will be using pulse width modulation or PWM for short. And this entire program is built around those four keywords so let's go ahead and take a closer look. Sleep mode is actually very simple, it's just one instruction, sleep. After that the controller shuts down the internal oscillator and all non-essential hardware and typically it needs less than a few microamps to run. But that is only half of the story because when the controller goes to sleep we also gotta make sure that it can wake up again somehow, right? That's where interrupts come in. Usually the main part of a microcontroller program is a big loop that runs over and over and over again. But when an interrupt happens, the program jumps to a special part of the code, the so-called interrupt service routine or ISR for short. Then this code here is run first and only after it's completed the main part of the code resumes as before. The good news, interrupts also work in sleep mode. 
In our case, there are two interrupt sources. The external on off button triggers an interrupt when it detects a logical high signal. And the other interrupt source is a timer that is connected to the watch crystal. A timer is just a counter and timer one that we're using today can count up to 65,535, which is 16 bit. In our program, we use the watch crystal to feed this timer. And because the watch crystal runs at 32.768 kilohertz, this timer flows over every two seconds. And whenever it flows over, you guessed it, it causes an interrupt. So in the interrupt service routine, we can just reset the timer back to zero or in our case, back to 32,768 because then it flows over every second and we can use it to keep the time. And like we said before, timer one keeps running in sleep mode because it uses the external crystal. So it will keep the time accurate even if the controller is in sleep mode. And last, our program needs to take the time information and convert it into a voltage. For that, we use pulse width modulation or PWM for short. In a nutshell, PWM creates the illusion of an analog voltage by quickly turning a digital pin on and off. The longer the pin is on, and that value is called duty cycle, the closer the apparent voltage is to five volts. In our case, we are using an eight bit system. So the duty cycle is a number between zero and 255. Now, how is this all related to the time? Well, 12 hours have 720 minutes. So if we take the minutes and divide them by three, we have a number between zero and 240, where 240 corresponds to a voltage of around 4.7 volts. So that doesn't cover the full scale, but it's easier to just divide by three and then decrease the potentiometer R8 so that the display maxes out at 4.7 volt instead of five volt. And that's the main idea of the program. Now, of course, we have to take all of this and convert it somehow into C code. And if you're interested in those details, then stay tuned for the dedicated video on that that will be out in a couple of days from now. But also remember, you don't have to code this entire program yourself. You can just go to the companion article right here. It has all the information that you need to get started with this clock. And so you can build it yourself, even if you're just a beginner and just getting interested in microcontrollers. With the program finally on the controller, we can remove the Picket 3 permanently and our clock is finished and ready to go. And now let's also make sure that this sleep mode thing really works as intended. When the clock is up and running, it uses around 45 milliamps of current, which is mainly the LED current and a few milliamps for the controller. But when the clock is turned off, you can see that the current drops dramatically, not to zero, but to around six microamps, which is a reduction factor of around 7,500, which I find quite impressive. Now, AA battery has a capacity of around 2000 milliampere hours, which is quite a lot if you think about the current draw of six microamps in standby, right? But does it mean that this clock can really run dozens and dozens of years in standby? Probably not because batteries have self-discharge and a typical shelf life of around 10 years or so. So it doesn't mean that it can run for a couple of dozen years, but it means you can put it in a drawer, forget about it a couple of months and it still have the time. So I think that's still a win for us. I was curious about the accuracy of this clock, so I connected my frequency counter to the watch crystal. And as you can see, it doesn't really oscillate at 32.76 at kilohertz, but it is close to it. So the accuracy is not very good, but it's acceptable. The reason for this frequency being off a little bit is that most crystals need a specific load capacitance to run properly. And in our case, that is the two 22 picofarad capacitors C3 and C4. But the breadboard is made of plastic and metal that affects the load capacitance. So we could solve this by using an adjustable load capacitor or by tackling this inaccuracy on the software side. If you decide to build this clock for yourself, then please let me know what you decide to do about those issues. And I'd be very happy to hear about it either here in the comments or on social media. I actually want to use this clock in my daily life. And for that purpose, I went to a local restore and I found this old tachometer. So I want to show you what I did to it. All right, so let's take the contents of this breadboard and somehow transplant this into this old fashioned tachometer that I got at a thrift store for $3.50. Now this thing is pretty beat up, but it has some switches and well, let's just see what we can do with it. So the first thing was to take this thing apart and this has just two screws on the back. And after that, let's have a look at what's inside. So there's the nine volt clip. This is something that measures some rotation in the car, I think. This is a panel meter. And then of course there are the switches and this super old fashioned classy looking PCB. Now removing these screws here, let's just take out the panel meter and then we can actually really have a closer look at what we're dealing with here. Yeah, and there you have it, all the different mechanical components all side by side and it was time to desolder stuff. So I used my trusty solder sucker here to remove the wires from the panel meter. And well, there it is. 
and then it was time to desolder, well, the switches. And I tried to use the solder sucker for this, but this was really hard. So I used some uh, desoldering wick instead, and that was much, much better because there was just too much solder that was clogging up the, the little solder sucker that I have. And that took a little bit of time, and it looks a bit messy here, but it actually works really, really well. And then I used my pliers to maneuver all the pins out of these holes. Um, took, took a little bit of convincing, but in the end it was fine and they just uh, came off without any resistance. And there you have it. That's the old PCB here. Yeah, it's coming off. Yeah, there it is on the right side. We, we won't be using this one. And then there this, there's the contacts of the switches. And I really had to clean some stuff at this point, like this old tape residue here. I did my best. It didn't all come off, but well, for now that's how, that has to be good enough. Um, also, these kind of stickers here. Well, it didn't come off all the way, but for now, that's good enough. And now with all of these things disassembled, let's put them all in a bag. And just to make sure that we don't lose anything and clean up the workbench a little bit while we're at it. Alright, so now I'm actually looking at the electrical parameters of this panel meter. So the internal resistance, the saturation current. And I'm using this formula here to determine the resistor that we need, this potentiometer. Turns out to be 3.1 kilo ohms, so we can just use the 5 kilo ohm that we used in the main project before just as well. But it may be different for your project. And while I was at that, I really wanted to clean this panel meter. And look at this. I mean, it doesn't look new, but well, close enough. And now it's time to put this all on a perf board. And I'm using this 5 by 7 centimeter perf board here. Of course, that's too big, so I'm just putting some pencil marks down. Um, and I have to stay in those lines, basically. There are all these components, and now it's just time to... Well, look at the breadboard and solder this all into place. Now, obviously, this thing here is sped up and the whole process took me around two hours, probably. Um, I'm laying down some traces here with um, just solder and that works really well with these kind of perf boards. And I'm just, you know, you occasionally looking at the breadboard, making sure that I'm connecting the right things to each other. And it is working through all those connections. Most of these are with these uh, lead traces at the bottom, but some of these are done with extra wires. And I try to keep the wires at a minimum to make this as flat as possible. And um, yeah, well, two hours later, I um, was more or less done. And here you see them side by side. Now, these are all pin headers that we have to connect later. And I put an LED in just in case and see it looks kind of OK. And those are the LEDs that I'll be using in the end of the project. And they're supposed to go under this part of the plastic here to make it look nice. So I took off this little shield here, uh, drilled the holes out a little bit bigger and add a little bit of chamfer so that the wires don't get cut. And then fix the LEDs in place with some hot glue because, you know, no project is complete without hot glue. I attached some DuPont style wires and I could close it up again. And there you go. This is how it looks like on the back. And I cut the perf board into shape and now we can connect things together. Oh, and this is the battery. Um, that I'll be putting on the back side of this panel meter, just like this. Now it's time to connect the switches, and we only need six wires for this. And I'm just using DuPont style wires again, and also some heat shrink tubing to prevent any short circuits or something like this. Putting in some batteries, and now we can actually start to reassemble the whole thing, putting stuff into place. And there you go, it takes a little bit of, you know, <laughs> fiddling here and there, especially screwing this back into place, but basically, all is done. And then I'm also fixing this uh, plate here in place with some trusted hot glue. And I put in the paper that I did the calculation on earlier as a joke, but also to prevent any shorts towards this aluminum plate. And plugging everything in. And well, yeah, it kind of sort of fits, I think. Well, close enough. Putting on the back side, reattaching the two screws, and well, then it's time to turn it on.
Now this project has a lot of different parts I know and I actually really like that about this project. But if it's a bit too much then go check out my tutorials on how to get started with PIC microcontrollers instead and you will see after some time with a little bit of practice that you can do it too and all of a sudden this whole project will make a whole lot of sense to you and I hope I can inspire you to go down that journey because it's just so much fun. Now also don't forget that there's a companion article on FriendlyWire.com that has a lot of additional information and download links that will help you build your own clock just like this one. And last here is something very important. If anything in this video doesn't make sense or if you're building this and something just doesn't work then please reach out to me either on social media or in the comments down below and I'll do my very best to get back to you so that you can also build a clock just like this one in the video right here. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what else you want to learn and I will see you next time.